What is up guys? My name is Jason and welcome to the Conspirators Podcast channel where I talk about everything from the unexplained to the completely insane. Due to the nature of the channel, some content may not be suitable for some audiences, so listener discretion is advised. Alright guys, so before we dive straight in today, I'd just like to say thank you to all of those who have already gone and liked and listened to the podcast. It really means a lot to me and I do appreciate all the support. Remember, I am available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and as of now, I'm available on YouTube as well. So you can go give it a listen there as well as on other listening platforms. Remember, drop a like, leave a comment. I do appreciate it on your preferred listening platform. But for now, guys, let's jump straight into the story where we'll be looking at the strange disappearance of Dr. James McGrogan. So this happened back in 2014, specifically on the 14th of March, where Dr. James McGrogan went out that morning to uh, get started on a hike with some of his friends, which were fellow practitioners. They went out hiking in Vail in Colorado, which is just a small town at the base of Vail Mountains. The trail they were going to look to do that that day was called the Spraddle Creek Trail, which went up towards a location called the Iceman Hut. The The Spraddle Creek Trail itself was about <clears throat> 7.1 uh, kilometers, <clears throat> and then the rest of the trek uh, that carried on up to Iceman Hut took it to a total of 14.5 kilometers, or 9 miles, for the entire, uh, the entire trip. Uh, from the research I did, it's not too bad. It's about, yeah, it's like I said, 14 and a half kilometers with about 374 meters of elevation. So not too bad, uh, but a decent hike. Now, James McGrogan and these uh, fellow practitioners were avid outdoorsmen. <clears throat> like this was something they did often. I mean, they, they had all the equipment. They even were carrying split boards with them, which are these uh, snowboards, which can be split into two for uh, ease of Tra- uh, like transport or travel with them so you could just like, kind of split them and put them in your bag so they were they, they, this was something that they were very versed in this was something they did on a regular basis they would go out and they were you know extremely fit and active uh, individuals so they obviously went out and decided they were going to go out and do the Spraddle Creek Trail up and carry on all the way up to the Iceman Hut now it was snowing, but uh, it was quite compact, and the trail was cre- uh, pretty clear and uh, visible. And it was a, just one of those beautiful snowy days out out in Colorado. Now, as I said, they were extremely fit and uh, experienced outdoorsmen. I mean, uh, Dr. Uh, McGrogan himself was a avid marathon runner, so extremely fit and healthy individuals that you know were going out together on this hike. You know. And being experienced, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. McGrogan had a, had a cell phone with him with an extra battery. He had a, a GPS transmitter. He had food. He had water, you know. And, um, you know, pe- prepared. You know, the guy was experienced. The guy was ready to go out and do this hike. He was a very experienced outdoorsman. Now, obviously, they, they left and decided to go up, up this mountain like that afternoon. So, obviously, they went out to the trails that morning. Uh, got there, set up, waited for everyone, got ready, and then decided to head up that mountain that afternoon. Now, obviously, it does take a bit of time to uh, hike, as I'm sure those who have experienced snow know it's not the easiest to hike in snowy conditions, and it does take a bit longer, but obviously still enjoyable. So they pushed on, obviously, up this trail, and, um, you know, Dr. McGrogan being one of the, the fitter and healthier individuals, being a marathon runner, you know, we're still feeling great when the rest of the group had um, called up and said to him, you know, they want to take a rest and stop for a little bit. Uh, whereas Dr. McGrogan, feeling uh, great and feeling, you know, confident and comfortable, decided, you know, he would push on ahead um, to another meeting point further up the trail. And the, the rest of the group would just simply meet him there, which they all agreed to. They had no problem with. So they decided, all right, that's fine. He went on ahead as they stayed back to... Um, you know rest and catch their breath and everything like that as they watched him you know venture on up the trail and eventually as the turns uh as he wound around the turns you know disappeared out of sight now obviously you're not going to think much of it at this point you know all avid outdoorsmen the guy carries on up the trail they can see there he goes there's his footprints and everything and he heads on so not not too long afterwards the group decide they're going to continue no you know they agree they agreed to meet Dr. McGrogan further up the trail 
So they, you know, decide it's time they're going to go meet him at this next point. So the group continue up to the, the next meeting points along the way, um, eventually reaching this point and no sign of Dr. McGrogan, not there. They can't find him, they decide to look around a bit, call out, and uh, nothing. Now, at this point, again, they're still not thinking much of it, thinking, you know, maybe he got to this point, you know, still feeling really good as, you know, exceptionally fit individual, um, in great physical condition. Maybe he decides just to push on forward through to Iceman Hut and um, meet them at the top. So at this point, they thought, do nothing of it, you know, it's normal, like, that's fine. Avid outdoorsman, you know, very fit, probably just pushed on. So they carried on past this meeting point, um, no sign of any venturing off the trail or, you know, at this point, obviously, with the snow. Uh, no traces of him he had been like left behind you know he just kind of seemed to have vanished but again with all the snow it didn't seem anything um out of the ordinary or strange so carry on and they reach at the iceman hut location uh at the top there which if you guys haven't uh, ever looked at it you should take a look at it the iceman hut it's um really beautiful e-i-s-m-a-n uh iceman hut is extremely beautiful if you guys are ever going out to colorado would definitely put that on the uh, list of places to visit. It's, it's extremely beautiful from up there. But to continue the story, they get to Iceman Hut and there is no sign of Dr. McGrogan. Nowhere to be seen. Absolute, just nowhere to be seen. And um, at this point now, it's starting to get a, <clears throat> a, bit, a bit weird. They look around, call out to him, but nothing, absolutely nothing. So at this point now, the, the group of physicians have realized there is something seriously wrong. Like, they, they, this is where they were meeting and staying before heading back down the trail. There was no further hike, no further trails. They, this is the end point for them. So at this point, they obviously all started to realize the seriousness of the situation and contacted the sheriff's department. This, um, this was the Eagle Valley Sheriff's Department, which then obviously led out a search party on foot and with snowmobile, obviously a large search party went out um, to the point where they even brought in three helicopters to assist in covering an 18 square mile radius, which they actually ended up having to search for five days. They just did not find any trace of Dr. McGrogan anywhere on that mountainside, obviously expanding that to that 18 square mile radius, you know, but um, on after five days, so after the fifth day, um, the search was brought to an abrupt end due to bad weather, which forced the helicopters to land and forced all the, obviously, um, searching parties to, to head back in for shelter. And this weather obviously prohibited any further search. Um, about 20 days after his disappearance, a group of hikers that went out into uh, Booth Falls discovered his body at the bottom of an ice fall. Now, the, this this ice fall basically, Booth Falls basically, from from Spraddle Creek Trail is, a, it's about eight, eight, eight kilometers, between eight and eight and a half kilometers or four and a half miles east from where Iceman Hut is. Now, this is this is within obviously like i said that that 18 square mile radius you know it's only four and a half miles away which is not a close distance but you know it's less than that 18 square miles and so it had been searched before they'd thoroughly searched been through the helicopters snowmobile on foot they'd been through this area yet 20 days later dr mcgrogan's body was now found all of a sudden in this area now it, the thing is it's not just a simple four and a half mile straight line kind of hike to where he was found. Not to mention that he was, it was strange in the sense he was found with um, a head trauma, a broken femur, you know, partially undressed. He had, he had removed his coat, which was actually funny enough, neatly folded and placed in his backpack, um, which obviously in snowing, like icy conditions is not something a logical human being would do. You know, he had removed his coat, his gloves, he had removed his boot, uh, his boots, but then he was still wearing his helmet. So it's not like he just simply decided to start undressing or, you know, in a state of confusion or panic, just undressed. Like it was literally his gloves, his coat, his shoes, and that was it. The rest he had kept on, and he, even his helmet was still on, which, which was quite strange, you know. And like I said, it's not an easy four and a half mile hike or eight and a half kilometer hike. To get to where he was found, McGrogan would have had to have literally traveled, uh, or like ascended and descended about 
5,200 feet, which is 1,600 meters, which if you think about it in eight kilometer uh, space is phenomenal, steep, steep, steep climbing and descending, almost ridiculous having to switch back down mountains. They're so steep because it's just impossible to kind of go in a straight line from there. So definitely not an easy hike um, by any means, nearing the point of almost impossible. And um, this would have meant that he would have, for that four, four and a half, kilom- uh, four and a half mile hike, he would have had to have traversed roughly 10 to 16 miles, as I said, like switchbacking and back and forth down these steep slopes to actually get to where he was, which again is, is, is almost impossible to get there. Like it, it's just completely out, out of the realm of the physically possible, um, especially in those conditions. Um, you know, he would have also had to head through Middle Creek, which is a creek that runs literally down in between these two these two um, locations. So he would have get, got had to go, go through this icy creek and fight through snow drifts up to thirty feet, which is nine meters of snow of, of snow uh, snow drifts. So an icy, so steep, almost impossible climbs and descends. Middle Creek, an icy creek running through the middle of the of these two locations, as well as nine meter snow drifts. That is insane. It is literally the point of almost impossible to get to where he was. And it makes no sense why or how he actually got there. Now, obviously, if we start taking a look at the profile of, uh, of Dr. McGrogan, we can start to understand uh, a bit more of his story, you know, so and why this is a missing 411 case. So we look at the intellectual, uh, intellectual extremes. Now, doc, Dr. James McGrogan, doctor, the man is obviously highly educated, extremely intelligent, you know, not just a specialist in his field that works with physicians, but an actual practicing doctor. So obviously on the higher end of the uh, intellectual extreme, as I said, marathon runner and like avid runner, you know, even when the rest of the physicians had to stop and rest, Dr. McGrogan pushed on, carried on, you know, so obviously on the higher end of the physical extreme as also well, extremely fit, extremely intelligent, but with the intelligence as well, we rope in the experience side of it. So he's a very experienced outdoorsman who knows what he's done and what, what he does and, um, you know, what to do in these situations. Again, um, you know, somehow still managed to disappear the way he did. It became very, very weird, very strange. Um, again, mid to late afternoon disappearance, another tick box on the, the missing 411 profile. The search was then interrupted by bad weather. As I said, after five days, that weather forced them to stop the search. Um, you know, he was found at the bottom of an ice fall, which I would say does still classify as a, you know, like a large body of, of water in a sense. It's a massive like ice field. Um, you know, he, he was found in a ready searched area. They had been there, they had covered this area, and he was found in an already searched area. You know, like, and the fact that he simply just vanished from the trail, he, like he just disappeared. That's another tick box. You know, he, he was there. They, they saw no sign of his trail leaving the path or anything like that. He just simply vanished from the trail with nowhere to be uh, seen or nowhere to be found he was missing uh, his shoes which is another tick box you know he had removed his shoes and they weren't found with him like his coat was at least in his backpack but his shoes were gone he, he had taken his shoes off and those had just disappeared like, i don't know why he would have done that but we'll dive into that a bit in, in a bit and um last but not least he was found in a extremely uh, hard to reach or impossible place. So like I said, and elaborated on quite a bit already, where he was found is almost impossible to get to from where he had started. I don't, it's just, it makes no logical sense to me how he would have made it that far and why he would have gone that far. That is the most confusing. Why would this avid outdoorsman decide to change course in such harsh extreme conditions to get to that location it just baffles me you know so some of the questions we have to ask about dr mcgrogan you know because some things just don't add up and don't make sense in this in a case of you know 
the man carried a GPS transmitter to obviously um, see where he was, so he had a GPS transmitter to, to, to guide himself, as well as send out his own location. Like, why why not use it? Why, if you had gotten lost or ventured off the trail, why not use a piece of equipment that is designed and kept on person for this exact reason? It just wasn't used, you know, the same way he, he, his cell phone. Why not use a cell phone? You and the excuse of no, no, maybe his battery died. He carried a spare battery for this exact reason. He was an experienced, well planned, and well prepared individual for these situations. And it was confirmed uh, by Politis actually that the area in which he was found did in fact have cell uh, cell reception. He did have signal in his area. Why not use the GPS transmitter? And at the very least, you use his cell phone to try call for help. Makes no sense whatsoever. You know, why Why didn't he call for help? Why didn't he try? And as much as I get it, people will say, you know, maybe maybe he caught up, maybe he got hypothermia, maybe he wasn't dressed correctly, which again makes no sense due to, uh, due to his intellectual and physical condition, you know. He, he, it just doesn't make sense why hypothermia would have been the thing to take him out. But... Even, even with that being said, you know, he he just vanished off that trail and to get to where he was, to, he wouldn't, even if it was hypothermia, he would never have made it that far through those conditions um, if it was hypothermia that he had succumbed to. And then at the same time, it's, you know, we can look at it from the case of suicidality. Um, although there were no indications or no uh, clear signs suggesting that Dr. McGrogan had any intention or uh, intention of going out and um, basically for a final hike. He, the, the physicians didn't feel that it was a case of, you know, he was trying to, you know, end everything. And also the way in which it was done, why would he have hiked to that specific location at an ice fall? You know, he could have simply just undressed and dove straight into the uh, middle Creek, you know, hypothermia and frostbite and all that would have taken him. And um, it just makes no sense. Completely um, strange. <laughs> but um, with that all being said, this is obviously one of the lighter, more mellow stories where it's more just a... one of those stories that doesn't make sense and doesn't understand why. The freakier and scarier and more weird stories will be coming later in the season. I didn't want to jump in all guns blazing for the first story. I thought we'd ease into missing 411 to almost basically start up with the easy stuff so we can kind of start seeing what missing 411 is, how it works, and what makes a missing 411 case. So this was a perfect example and a really great story to start out on. So I hope you guys all enjoyed the story today. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, telling it. Remember to go and leave a like or a f and give a follow, subscribe and turn on notifications on your favorite listening platform, guys. I will be uploading uh, every Friday is the goal. And um, I hope that you guys enjoy and follow me along. And I thank you so much for joining me today, guys. So for now, thanks for joining me today. Please don't forget to leave a review of the channel on your preferred listening platform. It really does help out the channel and I appreciate all the support. Thanks for listening today, guys, and I'll catch you all here next time. Bye for now.